Yes, I am in this struggle, and the struggle is real, and it is real for all of us, and we must struggle. God's not going to do it all for you. That's what it means to be a son and daughter of God. It is through the struggle that we actually find the revelation of the glory and the grace of God. God didn't come, Jesus didn't die on the cross to live life for you. He lived the life that you could never live to give us an example to say now we can in him. Matthew 5, 8, the verse written behind me, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. God is saying, I do want to draw near to you, but you first have to draw near to me. And he says, the price of admission is cleanse your hands, you sinners, and cleanse your hearts, you double-minded, just as it says in James 4, 8. And so God is saying, I desire to have a close and intimate relationship with you, but you also have to understand that I am holy. You know, we saw in Leviticus 10 when um, Aaron, who was at the time the high priest, his sons, Adab and Nabahu, uh, they got, were casual with the presence of God. They were doing stuff they were not supposed to do, and God actually struck them down. And this was such a so severe of an event that God tells Moses to tell Aaron, he says, don't even shed a tear. He says, you know, you need to contain yourself. There'll be time for mourning, but right now is not it. Because God says, by those who come near me, I must. Everybody say must. must. This is a divine imperative, which means you cannot go to God any other way. He says, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before the people, I must be glorified. The problem is, in our comfortable American Christianity, we have this idea that Jesus is our homeboy. As long as I just throw up a couple of prayers at night and throw a couple of bucks in the plate that me and JC, we're all good. Now, don't get me wrong. He says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, yes, he is the lover of our souls, he is our best friend, just as we were singing tonight. He desires your good. He's the one who created you. It says that he planned out your days before you were ever born, that he created you for good works that you should walk in them. He wants to give you a hope and a future. He has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. This is who our God is. But we also need to understand that even in his goodness and love and mercy... He is holy. I thank God that in his wisdom, he gave us his Holy Spirit. He says, I am not satisfied that the distance that your sin caused between you and I, that that simply be uh, gapped by a legal system of sacrifice. He says that I don't desire just to be God around you uh, uh, sometimes. You know, in the Old Testament, there was only one person, the high priest, who could go into the most holy place where the ark of, of God was uh, to go into his presence once a year on the Day of Atonement. And God says, I am not satisfied for one person one day to come into my presence. So I am going to send the high priest so that one person will die for the sins of all and the veil that separates God and men will be torn from top to bottom so that my sons and daughters and whosoever will can now come into my presence. And Jesus, as he ascends, he says, look, I'm calling you to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. But before you go, you need to wait until you're endued with power. And then on the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, they were there in the upper room, 120 individuals who were in one place, in one accord, all praying the same things. And then suddenly there came a sound like a mighty rushing wind and the Holy Spirit was breathed. And now God is saying, I'm not just around you. Now I'm going to be within you. I am going to speak to you myself. You're not going to have to inquire from a seer. I will give you eyes to see. You are no longer going to have to wait to talk to the man or woman of God. I'm going to make you be the man or woman of God. That I have desired not that you have prophets, priests, and kings, that you all be a royal priesthood, God's own special people. 
This is what the power of the Holy Spirit is about. See, the problem is we cannot pick and choose the attributes of God that we like or that cater to us. God is not a microwave. He's not a vending machine. And he's not a fast food restaurant. I'm sorry, you can't have it your way. What God is saying is, is if we do things his way, he says, I'll, I'll give you dreams and visions. And I'll even give you the desires of your heart. But first, I have to transform the desires of your heart. And before I can put things in your hand, all that stuff you're holding on to, you have to let go. We see this ultimately, uh, probably one of the best pictures of this is when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, Master, I, I recognize that you are the one who is to come. So, so can I be one of your disciples? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, all right. And he starts listing off some of the Ten Commandments. And he says, oh, yeah, I've done all those from my birth. Okay, bold statement. <laughs> and then he says, all right, fine, if you've done all that, but this one thing you lack, if you want to be perfect, See, you're trying to reach out for the kingdom, and it's good because the kingdom wants to reach out for you. But the problem is, is that you're still, your heart is holding tightly onto your stuff. And it says, and if you want to have the kingdom, your stuff can't have you. Because God is not going to share you. Just like when we get married, we're not saying, okay, I am going to marry my spouse, but they're going to be shared with other people, and that's fine. There is no open marriage with Jesus. He did not die to give us a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. He says, I want to give you the fullness of who I am, but that to, to access that, it requires holiness. Again, who was given on the day of Pentecost? Well, it was the Spirit. No, it was the Holy Spirit. And this is why God... The Old Testament and in the New Testament declares to us in emphatic terms, he's saying, therefore, because I have given you my power, because I have given you my presence, I've given you gifting that I desire to walk with you and among you and within you, therefore, says the Lord, come out from among them, talking about the world system and the dead works of sin. He says, be separate, be holy, says the Lord. and I will receive you. See, God accepts us on a legal basis. We call it justification. When we confess our sins, when we uh, in, incite heaven as to what Jesus did on the cross, when we are asking him to cleanse our souls, what can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so when we confess our sin, we are not just, he doesn't just cover our sin. He cleanses us and makes us new before God. He justifies us before the judge of heaven. It is just as if I never sinned. But it doesn't just stop there. God's desire for you is not just that you be justified legally. He says, yes, I have taken away the payment of sin, which is death, because I laid that upon my son. But now I'm inviting you to be transformed by my character and nature and to enjoy my presence. But the closer you get to me, I will get to you. But the thing is that, that is keeping the, uh, the distance is that we are holding on to our sin. And please understand if you love Jesus, you're in a fight. And each and every one of us, as human beings, are born into a war. It do, you cannot be a conscientious ob ob objector in the kingdom. That is not a thing. See, you're either fighting the battle or you're losing. Those, those are the two options. You know, and if you're looking at people from the world, you tell them that. They look at you like you're crazy, and they're saying, well, I'm not fighting any battles. That You are. You just don't know it. That's called being conquered. The Bible calls it being dead in sin. And so, as the Lord has been speaking to us about grace these past few Sundays, I was, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I had a day. You know, I, I work as an F-16 mechanic on, on base, and this weekend we have what we call drills, so we work the weekend. This is one of our long weeks. So today is Wednesday, 
for most of the working people, but today we call it Third Monday. <laughs> we still got five to go. And trust me, today was a Third Monday. I mean, I woke up in a spiritual battle. I mean, how many, you ever, like, the enemy, he does not fair. He does not wait for you to get your coffee. He starts, oh, oh they're starting to wake up. Let me start whispering. And I'm like, come on. I haven't even put my glasses on yet. Can you just shut up for a second? And Dean's like, why are you talking to me like that? No, I'm just kidding. She didn't say that, and she doesn't talk like that. I digress. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> Run. No. Um, yeah, just, but, uh. You know, and, and it was just one thing after another kept happening, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, Lord, I know we have service tonight, and more importantly than service, uh, you're doing something in the community. And so I know that there's a fight, there's a press, that you are calling us as individuals and as a body to, to press forward in prayer and intercession, that God himself has said, look, uh, now is the time. He has declared his desire for revival, and he's giving us the tools. He's saying, it is time to prepare the soil. See, what we want is God to say, it's time for revival, and then we go, yay, and then revival happens. But that's not how it happens. God says, it is my desire, now pray. This is why James says, Elijah was a human being just like you and I. But God used him for, to, to bring about a drought and then to bring back the rain three and a half years later. What God is saying is there has been a spiritual drought among his people and even specifically in Tucson, Arizona. And what the Lord is saying is I am calling for rain. And this is not the time to sit down, fold your arms and relax and say, oh, finally, God's going to do it. He is calling us just like Elijah did to put our head between our knees to start birthing some things in prayer and saying, oh, Lord, according to your word, God, our sins are many. And we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would reveal yourself once again, that you would come with a refreshing so that we may know you, that we would once again choose life and understand and know the lover of our souls. God, we are asking that you would help us to return to you. We are weak and destroyed because of our sin. We are full of pride and, and, and uh, self-sufficiency. Lord, help us to know our weakness, our wickedness. Help us to see that we really are poor, wretched, and naked, that we are in need of a father. We are in need of a, redeem a redeeming God, that we need you here in this city. And we say, go look. Do you see the cloud? And I said, no, man, that didn't. See, all right, everybody left the prayer meeting, and everyone said, okay, look, God didn't do it. I knew he, no, is that what Elijah did? No, he went to his servant and says, all right, you don't see anything yet? All right, oh Lord of the universe. And he goes and he prays and he does this seven times until finally he sees the cloud. He says, yeah, I know it's not a thunderstorm, but now I don't pray until I feel it. I pray until I see it. And now I see that God is performing his word. Now it's time to run because rain is coming and harvest is returning to the land. See, <laughs> I want you to understand this. Why God is calling for revival is not so we as believers can have an exciting experience. Don't get me wrong. I look forward to it. I want the healing, the blessing, the prophecy, the miracles. I want all of that. But revival comes so that it opens up the heaven, where our sins have shut uh, the heavens, where God has said, all right, fine, you want your sin, you have it your own way, and now there's going to be a spiritual drought. But then revival comes as his people repent, his people ask for forgiveness, begin to intercede, to call on his name, to turn from their wicked ways and seek the face of God. The, the, the brass heavens begin to break and open up. And we once again seeing Jesus, Jacob's ladder, where our prayers are now finally getting up to heaven. And we are seeing the will and the kingdom of God coming down upon the earth. And the reason why God desires revival in spiritual rain. It's to water the ground that is full of seeds of his word so that there can be a crop. It's not about you or I. It's about the harvest. It's about saving souls. It's about learning how to witness. It's about going to, to where God has called you to go. 
with an armful of, of life preservers saving those that are drowning and say there is a God in heaven. His name is Jesus Christ and he is here right now for you. And knowing all of that, it just, it seems it should be easy. We know that, you know, pray it takes time, but, but if that's really the goal, if, if God is desiring to pour out his glory and his presence, then this shouldn't really be that big of a problem. We, we see in the word that Jesus requires us to pray. He requires fasting. He even says that certain strongholds are only dislodged through prayer and fasting, and this is, should be the normal culture of those that follow Jesus. So, okay, we get that. The problem is day one of the fast. I love how the word says, it's easy to talk of fasting when the belly is full. Right. See, there are those that just kind of want to hang around the things of God so they can get wet. But then there are those that do the work to bring the rain. And what God is saying is, look, I will send it. It's not by power nor by might. We don't make God do anything. It's not about with our combined effort, we can convince God to move. But he's saying, no, if you align with me and abide in my word, watch me, and I'll move wonders. See, the word says that God is looking throughout the entire earth. He's looking to and fro to find someone who he can show himself strong on their behalf. Those whose hearts are loyal to him. And that has been the prayer of my life is, God, I know that there are so many areas in my heart and in my mind where there are still disloyalties to you. Help me to do war with those. Help me to crucify my flesh so that I can walk with you. See, it's easy to talk about the principle. It's not easy to walk it out. And the thing is, is that many of us enjoy times of blessing and refreshing and prophecy and all of those things, and it gives, it energizes our soul, which it should, and it allows us to run for a little bit. The problem is we think that this race that we're called to run is a sprint from here to the back door. But it says, no, this is a marathon. What is the difference between a sprint and a marathon? Endurance. Endurance. And so God is saying tonight, as I've been in prayer, I'm saying, Lord, what is it that you're saying? What is this heaviness that I'm feeling? And God started showing me a bunch of things that people were going through, uh, not necessarily specifics, but let's just say today was not just a bunch of frustrations in the natural. There was also a bunch of spiritual warfare going on. Well, why? Because the enemy does not want to see God. Therefore, he is throwing every temptation out. He wants you to make yourselves impure so that you don't see him. Because as we'll see here in a second, the word says that we become like him as we behold him. And so if the enemy can block your vision of God, he can block your transformation of God. And there is nothing that satisfies the enemy more than blind Christians who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof with their lives. And so in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 13, Jesus' disciples come to him and says, when will the end of the age be? And Jesus said, you will hear of and rumors of wars. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Then they will deliver you to up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. One will betray another, one will hate another, and then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, what's interesting there is that that word love in this sentence, he's not talking about phileo. He's not saying people are going to stop being brothers. He's not talking about being kind. What he's saying here, the word there for love is agape. This is the God kind of love. This can only come 
from God himself. It goes, comes to his people. We can love because he first loved us. So when he's saying, because lawlessness abound, the love of many will grow cold, are we talking about just general affection? No, the world has that. With agape love, he's talking about in the church. The agape love of God will grow cold in the church. By this, they will know you're my disciples. By how eloquent you're preaching, no. By how great you're programming, no. By how comfortable the chairs are. No, he says, by the agape love that you have for one another. That's how people are going to know that you're my disciples. But he's saying in the last times, many, and again, that Greek word many means most. He's saying most people in the end time church who claim to be Christian will be very selfish. The agape love of God will, be, will grow cold. And the reason why, is because they think that they can have their Jesus and their sin too. This rich young ruler, even though he got the opportunity to be the 13th apostle, went away sad because he was reaching out for Jesus. And Jesus says, first, you have to let go of that thing on your heart. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor and then come follow me. And he says, no, I got too much stuff. And some people say, well, following Jesus means you can't have any more. Jesus doesn't mind if you have money. God gets no glory by us scratching and being in, in poverty. The problem was with that individual. He didn't say everybody sell everything. He said to him because he didn't have money. His money had him. And he says, I'm not going to share you with another. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But those who endure to the end shall be saved. Let's all say that uh, together. But those who endure to the end shall be saved. Why do we need endurance? Because the enemy is trying to wear us out, wear us down, and ultimately take us out completely. You know, again, we, we hear Jesus say in John 10.10 10, that the thief, the enemy, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his whole goal. And he knows that if he comes with a frontal assault, the enemy comes with a, you know, points a gun at your head, you're going to say in the name of Jesus, and he's gone. So he doesn't come as the big bad beast. What he comes is dressed up like your favorite temptation. He, he comes like that argument with your spouse. He, he comes in that moment when you've had not enough sleep with that whispering in your ear, that thing that almost sounds right but is completely wrong. Matthew 5, 8, again, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. The enemy does not want this to happen. And even there are a lot of us that are on this fast to the end of the year. We have 91 days left. Today is on the Julian calendar is 275. So after today, there are 90 days left. And that may seem crazy and extreme, but here's the reality. If you don't want to be on the fast, you don't want to join the fast, don't. It's fine. But we're hungry. We're desperate. I, I want to see, I need to see a move of God. And the thing is, is I know that in my uh, sin and selfishness, I can't get it done. I need more of him. I need to do war with my flesh. I need less of me and more of him. He must increase and I must decrease because I want to be one that God can trust to use to bring about and to prepare people for his coming. I want to raise the valley, to lower the high places, to make the rough places smooth, to prepare a road for the king in the, in the desert. This is what I desire, but I can't do that if I still have my pet sins in the closet that I'm not addressing and allowing the Holy Spirit to confront. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So how does this transformation come about? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How does it get activated? How does the Holy Spirit take us from glory to glory? It is as we behold him. 
Again, you become what you behold. And let me tell you, the struggle is real. <laughs> Again, if you think you're doing all right, just go ahead and go on a fast. It will, you, it will, your flesh will show up and say, howdy, how you doing, real quick. Which is actually one of the main points of the fast. is saying, I'm going to lay, uh, lay aside my fleshly appetites so that my spirit can feed on the spirit of the Lord. God wants a refreshing, but the problem is, is that too many of us get full on things that don't satisfy, that are meaningless, that are spiritually, uh, nutritionally vacant. <laughs> you know, I told you a couple of weeks ago that I had an opportunity to go out and get one of my favorite steaks with some friends, and we were very excited about this. Uh, the steak came, I ate about two bites of it and just sat there staring at it, very sad. My wife's like, you look like you're about ready to start crying. What's going on and why is that steak still there? And I was like... Well, because before we got here, there was this bag of licorice on the counter, and it was good. And I ate it, and now I'm full. <laughs> and I cannot eat steak, and I'm trying. It was a sad day. And the Lord said in that moment, he said, exactly. He says, I'm trying to feed you, but your belly is full with the wrong thing. And so why are we in this time of fasting? Because I want to get hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Because he says, when we hunger, he will feed us. The problem is our appetites are on the wrong things. In Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, and I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, Paul writes and he says, it is the law sin? And he's, he's talking about how when the law comes, it, it, it uh, shows us our sin nature. He says, sin, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. To put that in modern vernacular, I mean, how many of you are thinking about the color red right now at this moment? No, not a lot of you, but if I say don't think of the color red, what are you thinking about? Okay, there's the law of sin right there. <laughs> you know, we don't care about the red button until someone says don't push it. <laughs> this... <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> you know, and, and it, 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 same thing with fasting. Like, I do not like black licorice at all. If you do... More power to you. You can have mine. Um, do not like black licorice. But if I were to go on a fast and say, I'm fasting black licorice, there's a part of my flesh that says, how do I get me some black licorice? It's like, I don't even want this, but my flesh does. And so verse 8 says, but sin, taking an opportunity by the commandment, produces in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And then we jump to verse 15. It says, uh, what I will to do, what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's the thing that I end up doing. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will, and he's talking about desiring God's will for us, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I don't find. I want to do it. I don't know how to do it. I end up not doing it. It says, for the good that I will to do, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Now, he is not saying the devil made me do it. He is not saying, well, it's a sin that dwells in me. I don't, I don't really have responsibility for my sin. No, and we'll see that, that Paul is actually taking full responsibility for his sin. But what he's saying is there are these two dogs in a fight on the inside of me. I have, there's, on one side, I desire to do the will of God. But on the other side, in my flesh and sin, I, I want to kill God, myself, everybody around me, and just get what I want, even if it kills me. Like, and all these two things are at war within me. Excuse me. And I love what he says. He says, uh, I find then uh, a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, meaning his flesh. Verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, I thank God he did not end this chapter with verse 24. Because I don't know how many times I have cried that out. I mean, I cried that out today. Lord, I am trying with everything that is within me, and I know that I can't kill the flesh with the flesh, so I'm asking that you would come and help me to walk in the Spirit. But even though I'm trying to walk in the Spirit, I'm still battling the flesh, and it seems I take you know one step forward, three steps back, and the harder I try, it seems like I'm doing worse than I was before. And, 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 and people are looking at me, and I'm supposed to be leading, and yes, Lord, help me me to be holy as you are holy, but I'm finding myself there as holes in my holiness. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's what he means by that. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That if we keep seeking after him, he will never leave us nor forsake us. That he is our friend, our father. He's the one who goes before and the one who stays behind. He is our advocate in heaven. He is our friend, our counselor. He is the one who is with us in the valley so we don't have to be afraid. So yes, I am in this struggle and the struggle is real and it is real for all of us and we must struggle God's not going to do it all for you that's what it means to be a son and daughter of God it is through the struggle that we actually find the revelation of the glory and the grace of God God didn't come Jesus didn't die on the cross to live life for you he lived the life that you could never live to give us an example to say now we can in him this is what the grace of God is all about it says, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So you have this dichotomy of hope and hopelessness, of strength and weariness in this battle against sin in the flesh. And then Romans 8, verse 1, this is the very next verse. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, if we walk in the spirit, we will not gratify the lusts of the flesh. Jumping down to verse 18 of Romans 8, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, how many of you have ever exercised, ran, worked out, any of that, just by a show of hands? Okay. It's terrible. <laughs> Especially back when I was doing weightlifting, man, I'd, I would be sore, sore coming home. Um, and because when, what you're doing is you're actually ripping muscles so that more can grow. You're using more of the, uh, the fiber bundles of your muscles, to, and, and the more of those you use, the more your body produces so that you can use more. You have weak muscles because you don't use them. So the more you use your muscles, the more you're telling your body to use the muscles, the more it's saying, I need more muscles to use the muscles. And the Lord is saying, we, it, he is calling us to a place of exercise, of running this race, of lifting. So, because here's the thing. We want God's glory, but we don't understand there's a weight to it. In fact, glory literally means weight. And sometimes, you know, it's just, it's a struggle just saying, in the name of Jesus. You know, it's, it's a struggle quoting John 3, 16. And he's saying, look, you're not ready for my glory yet. You need to do some work in prayer. You need to do some work in your own life and in mentoring and counseling. You need to do some work in my word so that you can build some muscle so that I can give you my glory, so that you can carry my glory. See, remember, the Ark of the Covenant was not to be a box on a cart. They thought that's how you were supposed to carry the presence of God, and they got in a lot of trouble for that. David's, one of his really good friends, Uzzah, was killed instantly because he thought he could touch the presence of God. And he says, look, you don't support me. I support you. Goodbye. David later found out that the ark, the presence of God, is not to be drugged on a cart by animals. It is to be 
carried by his priests. That's you. That's me. We are all called to be priests. We are called to carry the glory, the weight, the presence of God into your family, into your workplaces. It's not just about how well can Pastor Trevor preach. No, it's are you listening to what God is saying? Are you applying it in your life? Are You are the priest of your home. You are the priest of your uh, workplace. It's not about God make me a priest. He already did when Jesus died on the cross and you said, save me, Lord. You became a priest that moment. The thing is, are you doing your job? Are you strong enough to carry? But see, the thing is, in prayer and in fasting, and especially with the temptations in the world and everything going on in the news and and everything, it's exhausting. Number one, this is why we are to daily go to the Holy Spirit and develop a prayer life so that he gives us grace to endure But also God is saying, do not let the weariness of this world take you out. Don't get me wrong. We have all been there where it feels like we can't take another step. And then Paul comes in in Ephesians 6. He says, after you have done everything, just stand. But I feel like I can't raise my hands anymore. Okay, I'll bring some errands and hers around you. This is why I've placed you into a community and a family of believers. And in those times, the enemy tries to say, look, God's forsaken you. And he said, no, I'm right here, but I'm not going to lift the bar for you. You got to do that extra rep because I need you to feel the pain. I need you to feel the tension and the tearing because if I lift the bar, I'll get stronger. I'm already strong. You're the one that needs to grow in strength. And so he says, I can't do it for you because you won't grow. And I say, wait, are you saying that God will allow us to go through pain? Jesus said, in this life there will be trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And if you're in me, you overcome too. As he is, so are we in this world. If you want to operate in the grace, power, love, and truth of God in the way that Jesus did it, guess what? That's God's desire for you too but you got to get it the way he got it. Getting up early, getting into prayer, seeking the Father instead of your own will, of pulling on the Holy Spirit and the grace of God on a daily basis, not just once a week. Now, for some of us, it may be a little easier to identify their infatuation with food. Yeah, I don't know who, but look, I like to eat, okay? For those of you that know me, I love to cook. I, I love everything about food. Uh, you know, it's, I will be courteous and nice and decent, but there, there are two things that I don't beat around the bush and I don't get diplomatic about. The word of God and food. Because if I'm nice to you when you cook me bad food, you're going to cook it for me again. How many of you like food? Just how many foodies we got? Okay, see, there's my people. All right. (laughs) Do you guys want to eat once a week? Is that going to work out for you? Then why are we only feeding on the bread of life when someone else is talking to us? When God has made it available for us to come to him daily, multiple times a day, just as much as you need three meals a day, our spirit, you know, I love Daniel. Even when they made it illegal for him to pray, he still did it. He opened his window. He said, you're going to arrest me. Let's get it done. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up to the top of the tower. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live stream to everybody. I am getting on my face before the Lord three times a day. I need a meal. I need my spirit to feed on the bread of life. And you know what? Through Daniel's prayers and intercession, the people of God, Return to their homeland because he was a man who knew how to eat the right things. He had endurance. Romans chapter 8, verses 34 and 39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Who wants to sign up for ministry? 
Verse 37, it says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities or powers nor the things in the present or things to come nor height nor depth or any other created thing will be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the book of 2 Corinthians has some really powerful things to say. And I just pulled a couple of verses out of chapters 2, 3, and 4 that are pertinent to where we are right now. And in case you haven't gotten the point, God is saying, I know you're weary. I know you're working. I'm seeing your labor and your struggle. But he's saying, stop where you are. Take a breath. Get your eyes back on me. I'm going to refill you with my spirit and give you strength. See, there's this phenomenon that happens when you're running and you feel out of breath and everything in your body wants to shut down. The lactic acid starts going and then the lizard mind in your head starts going off saying, you're going to die. Stop running. But if you push through that, something happens. You get what they call a second wind. The endorphins start going. Uh, the soreness starts fading away. You're able to go longer and, and stronger and, and more methodical. And what the Lord is saying is that I am calling my people to a second wind. That yes, he understands that right now there is weariness. There is a weight that we are all under, but the weight of the world and the weight of the warfare is preparing us for the weight of his glory. And he's saying, I am building you up so that you can go, but before you go, you need to wait and sit at my feet so that I can fill you and feed you and give you life so that you can get up, take what I'm giving to you and run. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 17, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So how does God tell the world about himself? You and me. Now he says, and who is sufficient for these things? Oh, sorry, let me, let me, verse 15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of life leading to life, and to the other the aroma of death leading to death. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of from God, we speak in the sight of God. See, it is not your job to figure out for somebody else how the fragrance of Christ is going to hit them. And I've experienced that. There are times when I've been talking about my best friend. I've been talking about my father. I'm, I'm talking about my Savior, Jesus. And there are times when people are all about it. It's like God is giving revelation. It's a kairos moment. The prophetic is happening. I can tell God is touching their hurts and their woundings and showing them uh, hope and the possibilities for a tomorrow. But I've also had the other conversation where the fragrance wasn't coming off as life. I wasn't coming off as light blue. I was coming off as something brown. <laughs> And, you know, some people are like, get that out of here. That is, that is a sting. I don't want to hear nothing about your Jesus. And it's like, okay. It's not my job to try to pretty things up for people. It's my job to listen to the Holy Spirit, to go where he leads, and to cast the seed that he gives me where in the places where he calls me to go and leave the rest to God, praying the whole way. And he says, who is sufficient for these things? You are not the one who determines how your life is going to hit somebody else. But it is your job to stay in the anointing. If you've ever smelled anointing oil, it's strong. If We have some up here. It has a very strong, uh, uh, sweet uh, uh, cinnamon fragrance to it. And... if you know, Some of you know when I have put this anointing oil on my hands, not because you see it or even feel it, but it's because you smell it. And this is the thing, the, your coworkers, they can smell your life. What do you smell like? Do you smell like Jesus? Do you smell like life? Do you smell like, even when you're going through stuff, are you going through a valley with Jesus? Or are you complaining? Are you gossiping? Are you talking? And this is the thing, is what is your life smelling like? 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if we are walking in the Spirit, we are walking in freedom. And so when people are making a withdrawal from our grace account, we, what we are offering them is the hope of Jesus Christ. We are offering them the path to freedom. This is why uh, the word says that we are to study to show ourselves approved so that you, were, you will be able to give someone an answer when they ask you about the hope that is in you. When people look at your life, do they see an opportunity for hope? Or are they run and saying, I won't be like that. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 through 12 says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. For we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 7, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. You know, and it's hard because sometimes I know that I got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me, but sometimes the earthen vessel is the thing that's taking the front seat where people are seeing the cracks and the frailty and the weakness. And see, it's not about pretending that we're something that we're not. See, I'm honest about uh, where I'm at and what I'm going through. You know, I'm not trusting my coworkers with my, my deepness and my wounds and all of that. But they're t- look, if I'm having a bad day, I'll tell you, but God is still good. He's still on the throne, and we're, we, he, he's my right hand. So I may be having a bad day now, but weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So I may be having a bad day, but I still have my joy and my hope. Uh, there is j- uh, jope, uh, jope? <laughs> There is hope and joy for tomorrow. There, there is Job. That's funny. All right. Now, it says that so that it may be the power of God. You know, again, this is a guy who said, hey, I got this thorn in the flesh. God, I really don't like it. Please take it away. And he says, no, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is perfected in weakness. I love when people uh, find out that I'm a pastor or maybe they've come a couple of times and they want to tell me all the reasons why I shouldn't be pastoring. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I agree. You, you, you should hear my background and where I come from. You'd, I agree with you that I shouldn't, but God should have killed me a long time ago. I know. But here's the thing. By the grace of God, I am what I am. God doesn't use me because I'm the best. God doesn't use me because I'm the brightest. He uses me because I say yes when he said, who will I send? And that's not special for me and Adina. That is God's, see, Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. The few that are chosen get chosen because they said, yes, God, I will go through the pain of the purifying process so that I can hear your call. So I will say, here am I, send me. Verse 8, it says, we are hard-pressed on every side. Anybody feel like you're just hard-pressed? It doesn't matter where you go. I'm at my family, there's hard. You know, I'm at work, that's hard. I'm, I'm going to school. That's hard. I'm trying to sleep. That's hard. Like there's no place to rest. We are hard pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. What Paul is saying is just like like I wrote that I desire to see the power of his resurrection, but I also desire the opposite so that I may know Christ. I want to know the depths of his suffering and thanks be to God. He said, okay to both. Verse 11, for we who are alive or we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Summarize, he says this in verse 12. 
So then death is working in us, but life in you. In this hour of where we are as individuals, where we are as a church, where we are as the people of God at this point in human history, we need endurance unlike any other time. The word says that we are to have endurance as we run this race that God has set before us. He's not going to take you from pain. He's not going to remove all the hardships. He's not going to take the obstacles. He says, yes, that mountain's in your way. That's why I gave faith. And if you have faith, even as a mustard seed, you are the one that can declare prophetically to the obstacles in your way, and they will be removed. God is not looking for weak people who are 40-year-old babies. He is looking for sons and daughters who mature into mothers and fathers, who grow into the faith to say, Lord, I take you at your word. I believe what you say. And yes, I have bad days where I feel pressed on every side, where it feels like I can't take another step, where the lactic acid of my spirit is building up. And so, Lord, I just need a rest day in your presence. And he says, okay, there are times, you, we, spiritually, we need to develop work, rest, cycles. But the beautiful thing is that the work, rest, cycles are the same in God. Let me explain, and I'm closing with this. In the priesthood, in the book of Leviticus, it talks about how the, the Old Testament priests were to approach God and do the, the work of worship. The priests were to wear linen garments. It's not just because they were fly. It was because linen allowed them to breathe. You were not to sweat in the presence of God. Why? Because labor was a condition of the fall or a result of the fall. And he says, yes, there are times when you need to work to prepare for my presence. But then after you're done with the work, you are to wash in the laver, the water of the word. Then you are to put on the linen. Let yourself cool down, get clean, get refreshed. And now you come into my presence and my presence does the work. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when we are to engage in spiritual warfare. There are times when we are to work in travail, in intercession, to birth things in the earth. But there are also times that we, when we are in prayer, we're just loving on God and letting him love on us. And we find that as we are going through these, these, these work rest cycles, that it's all about his presence. See, yes, there are times when we declare, but we are declaring his word. It is not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so he is not calling us to do the heavy lifting of the work of transforming lives. You can't do it. He's not asking us to, to raise the dead. He's not asking us to perform the labor of the ministry. He says, my Holy Spirit will bring about the transformation. My Holy Spirit will tear the veil. My Holy Spirit will go before you and perform the miracle. But you as my priests, I'm, Martha, thank you for the sandwiches. But you need to be more like Mary right now and just sit at my feet listen to my word, to get into my presence and let my word do the work. We have our part to play. And I'm not saying God's just going to do everything. We just cuddle up with Jesus and don't have to do with anything in our life. But what I am saying is when we are filled with his spirit, when we are people of the word, when we live a lifestyle of getting into God's presence and we are quick to repent of anything that distracts or distorts that in our lives, then we become the priests with linen garments that, yes, there are things that we have to do, but we do it from a place of resting in him and his word does the work. Endurance, see, here, here's, here's the point in what I'm saying, and then, yes, I promise I'm closing. God isn't saying work harder, do more, be faster, produce more. You, you, you're not getting it right. You're doing it wrong. You got to get up faster. He's not saying any of those things. He's saying if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you'll be connected to the vine and you will bear fruit. When's the last time you saw a lemon tree struggle? When's the last time you saw a fig tree? Just, oh, I've got to make the fruit. <laughs> How do they do that? 
They just sit in the soil, soak up the sun, drink in the water, and trust God. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. They will rise on wings like eagles. See, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I would always have these dreams of being able to fly. And it was so liberating until I looked down. And for some reason, I was only like an inch and a half off the ground and going like a mile and a half uh, per hour. It's super slow to like, I don't know how many dreams I had where I'm like, well, this is not efficient. And I just got up and kept walking. And then I remember there was a time when I, I was in prayer and the Lord showed me like that I was walking and running. And then all of a sudden I just took off. He's saying, son, in me, you can do things that you could never do. See, even in your imagination, the, the, the magnitude of your power and potential was <laughs> floating on the ground at a mile an hour, an inch off the ground. He says, but in me, I'm going to teach you how to fly. I'm going to give you my perspective. I'm going to put my name on you. I'm going to give my Holy Spirit to you. And I'm not only just going to say you are a servant in the house, but I'm saying you are a son in my heart.